Good afternoon, Nerd Fam, and welcome back to our Cube Studios here in Palo Alto, California. My name is Savannah Peterson. Very excited to be doing a special preview segment for KubeCon and CloudNativeCon in Salt Lake City next week with Toby from Nutanix. Toby, thanks so much for taking the time to come hang out. Thank you for having me. It must be a busy time for you all getting ready for KubeCon. Lots of prep over the last few weeks, um, and uh, you know we have some exciting announcements. I know we can't talk about the exciting announcements today, but everyone should tune in to both our live interview from the show floor as well as videos we have coming out on the 12th with some of that news. But I wanted to talk to you. You've been in the space, well, you've been in both AI and in Kubernetes for quite a while, a bit of an OG here. And I'm curious, why is this event so important to you and to your community? It is really the biggest event in our industry, I think. This is where everybody comes together. It's, uh, it's getting bigger every year. It started as you know, primarily KubeCon, even though it was always called CloudNativeCon. But uh, you know, the number of projects that just kept getting added around Kubernetes and, uh, and all the you know, add-on events, the side conferences that now happen for all the other open source projects around Kubernetes, you know, it's just been growing at such a tremendous rate as a community, as an event. And I think what's exciting too is like it keeps evolving. Um, if you look at you know the talks last year and also this year again, so much AI content now um, mm -hmm. that wasn't there a few years ago. But uh, you know Kubernetes has very quickly become the platform of choice for AI workloads. So you know it's super exciting to talk about all that. Do you think that I, I love that you just brought that up because I was going to ask you about it anyway? Do you think that AI adoption and, and hype, quite frankly, at this stage has accelerated Kubernetes adoption at the enterprise? I think it has, yeah. You know, it's, you know, often when, when people adopted Kubernetes, they do adopt it first for new workloads, for new projects that they're doing, rather than, you know, replatforming old applications. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the AI hype, uh, it, it's just created a lot of pressure to innovate for a lot of organizations. They need to figure out, how do I put this in my environments? And, you know, what's really important for, for AI is the data, of course, right? Mm -hmm. The better data you have, the more data you have, the more results and leverage you're going to get out of AI. Now, data is something that most organizations really want to protect, right? It's their intellectual property, it's their customer data. And so when they look at AI, many organizations want to run those workloads where the data sits, yeah. which is often not on the public cloud. It's in their data centers, it's in their on-prem environments. And so Kubernetes can really help their you know, it can help bring the AI to the data, so to speak. I 100% I agree with you, and I think, I think it's a really interesting moment. We're seeing, you know, Kubernetes have its Linux moment. We're, we're seeing AI starting to distill a little bit from all hype to people actually wanting to realize true ROI and benefits from the technology. The challenge is, as we all know, Kubernetes can be a bit complex. Yes. How do you and the team simplify that for users looking to start these new projects and invest in AI? Yeah, that's, that's actually been a focus uh, for us from day one. You know, we've always focused on creating a great user experience um, around the technology. That was the case when we were at Day2AQ or Mesosphere, and it is still the case now that we're at Nutanix. Because, you know, turns out Nutanix also really values a great user experience and making powerful technology easy to use. And, uh, you know, that's where I would say uh, a lot of our secret sauce exists, mm -hmm. um, you know, that we add around the open source uh, core technologies that make up our solution. Because, yeah, Kubernetes and related technologies, you know, it, it can be a bit of a nuclear power plant, you know, a lot of knobs there. And we keep adding to the stack too, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of observability tools and, you know, we want a service mesh and all these other things. And, you know, with AI added to it, that's driving even more complexity because, you know, now you're running training environments and you're running inference environments. They're different. They run on different infrastructures. And so, um, you know, it's something we're focused on. What we do is we really embrace the Kubernetes API model early on to run everything up and down the stack, declarative APIs for everything, cluster API, so that people can deploy their Kubernetes clusters consistently across mm -hmm. any infrastructure. Um, and just building a lot of automation in general to, um, to make it easy to use. Yeah, so faster, more efficient, and, and with a friendly UX, which everyone appreciates. You're, the Nutanix Kubernetes platform also touts instant platform engineering. And I know that you recently wrote a blog post about this, a little tension in DevOps land and platform engineering. Can you dive into your perspective there a little bit? For yeah. Me? 
It's one of my favorite things to talk about, yeah. Um, you know, when, so our, my history, my company's history with uh, Cloud Native uh, predates Kubernetes. Um, mm -hmm. We were originally called Mesosphere because our first product was based on a different open source project called Apache Mesos um, that predates Kubernetes. And um, so for a few years, that was our main product. And, uh, you know, every organization that adopted this ran it as a central platform. And the early pioneers of, of cloud native and containers like Google and Twitter and Facebook and others, that's how they run their infrastructure too. They have mm -hmm. a platform team that's called something like platform infrastructure or technical infrastructure. And they build and run the platform for all the different development teams to run on top of. Now, when Kubernetes first became very popular, um, people kind of went a different route because it was around the same time where DevOps really took off and, and DevOps really advocates for decentralization. Mm -hmm. Kind of you build it, you run it type mentality. And so I ran into a lot of organizations that ended up with hundreds or sometimes even thousands of Kubernetes clusters that are all managed by different teams, usually without consistent standards. Like, I was gonna say that sounds a bit chaotic. It's totally chaotic. In fact, a few years ago at KubeCon, uh, this was, um, I, th I think it was the Seattle KubeCon, you know, a few days before that KubeCon, there was uh, a bug in, in the Kubernetes API server. Um, it was a security issue and people had to fix it. And pretty much every one of my conversations at the booth was around, you know, I discovered all these clusters that I didn't know about. And, you know, we have 10 different ways to manage them. My last week was hell yeah. trying to fix all these issues. And so, um, you know, I think DevOps is a great concept, first of all, you know, empowering developers. But you're gonna get the best value out of Kubernetes if you run it as a centrally managed platform. And, and that's kind of what I talk about in, in my blog post and, and how we architected our product. Mm -hmm. It's really meant to be run by a central platform team, a platform engineering team, which then you know, provides an easy path to production for the developers. And, and you know, I sometimes like to say, you know, DevOps is great, but if your DevOps teams are doing a lot of ops and not a lot of dev, then, then that's not so great. Yeah, one of the stats that always strikes me that I heard at a few KubeCons ago was most of your developers are, are only using 27% of their time to, to write code and to build and to create versus so much admin time and everything else that goes into that. So right. I, I completely agree with you there. Bring that time back, get those efforts in those clusters and that data out of silos and in something centralized that's easy to use. Right. Sounds like the perfect solution. I know there's a lot going on for the Nutanix team in Salt Lake City. Can you give us a little preview? Yeah, so we're, uh, we have a talk. Um, one of our AI team members, uh, John George, is uh, talking about how they added uh, NVIDIA NIM support to KSurf. He's a contributor to KSurf and Kubeflow. So that's on Thursday at 525 uh, in Ballroom A. Um, you know, we have a booth, of course, um, some fun giveaways there. So go check out the booth. It's, it's close to the coffee lounge near the entrance. I know, it's critical. I feel like you're going to be a hot, a hot booth because of that placement. I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to find me at the booth too at times. My team's going to be there, um, you know, product and engineering folks and others. So come chat with us. And then we're also going to make an announcement. But we'll keep that a secret until next week. It's a very big week. Super excited about that. You all should be excited about the announcements. Possible we've had a sneak peek. But I am, it's, it's a very exciting time for Nutanix. And, and I'm delighted to help break that announcement next week and celebrate your launch there. I'm also stoked to check out the swag. We do a pretty notorious swag segment at KubeCon every year. So it's probably the most competitive KubeCon segment that, or the swag yeah. segment that we do because the developer crowd and open source crowd I think is is uh, hard to impress. There's there we're, true. there's a lot of authenticity and whatnot that that goes into all of this. Okay, last question for you: What do you hope to be able to say after KubeCon next week? Well, without revealing any details, that you can't say yet today. What what makes next week a huge success for y'all? Yeah. You know, for us, like I said, it's, it's all about making this technology easy for people. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we think we have a fantastic platform that um, people can run anywhere. They can run it on-prem, they can run it on the cloud with public cloud services like EKS and AKS. Uh, we provide storage, really critical for the AI workloads in particular, but any workload in general. So, you know, I, I'm hoping people come to us and, and, and check us out and see, you know, this is really the one platform I'm, I need to run all of my modern applications 
And by the way, Nutanix has been around the block, so all of your other enterprise applications too that run in VMs. So, you know, I think we have a lot to offer there and I'm looking forward to talking to everybody at the booth. I think that it's going to be great. We really hope it's a successful week for you. Always fun to learn more. Someone who was following D2IQ for many years before this, it's great to meet you as well, Toby. Thanks again for taking the time. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Yes, my pleasure. And thank all of you for tuning in to this special KubeCon preview from our studios in Palo Alto, California. My name is Savannah Peterson. Looking forward to having you all watch the Cube next week for our three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage in Salt Lake City here on the Cube, the leading source for enterprise tech news.